I'm in Scotland and I can't overlook the coming into being uh, in Scotland this week of the new hate crime laws. Uh, it's a sad, it's a sad week for Scotland, really. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that my homeland is leading the way into a new darkness, uh, born of the power-hungry, uh, sensorial attitudes of uh, those in uh, those in office. Uh, the new hate crime laws that I speak of in Scotland are the ones that seriously, they dangle the threat of up to seven years in jail over the heads of anyone uh, judged to have stirred up hatred against a protected group. And I'm using the language uh, there of the new legislation. The protected groups in question are designated in the main uh, on the grounds of uh, race, sexuality and religion. Uh, let's just say, as a, for example, men who say they are women are specifically protected from hate in the new legislation, uh, while actual women are not. Advocates of free speech, myself among them, I've said for years that the new laws are too vague, um, too open to interpretation, uh, too vulnerable to abuse by bad actors uh, ever to function as good law. The police, uh, members of the legal profession and others uh, well qualified to comment have warned uh, that the authorities will be flooded with complaints and allegations of hate crime by anyone and everyone with an axe to grind against an enemy or against an opponent. Uh, you'll get um, mischief. Uh, uh, people just determined to cause trouble for their neighbours or, or for people that they have a beef with uh, by accusing them of having st stirred up hatred. Um, we'll have to wait and see what actually happens from now on, obviously, but it's worth bearing in mind that this new legislation comes from the Scottish National Party, the SNP, an entity that has been and continues to be a disaster for Scotland. I would say the whole devolution project has been a disaster for Scotland. Uh, but the devolution project has spawned the SNP in its present form. Uh, I mean, just as a for instance, under the stewardship of the SNP, the land famous for the Clyde, famous for shipbuilding, demonstrably can't build ships anymore. Under the SNP, uh, the people of the islands, the islands off the west coast of Scotland, have waited six years now for two ferries, just two ferries that never come. And if and when they do come off the slipways, they'll have cost at least four times as much as they were supposed to. Uh, you know, the land of shipbuilding, those days are gone under the SNP. Uh, the ferries fiasco is only a symbol of broader national decline. Scotland is led now by SNP First Minister Hamza Yusuf, uh, and he got that job, the top job, after failing and falling upwards. Not once, not twice, but three times. When he was transport minister, the trains were never on time. Uh, when he was justice secretary, the police were all overwhelmed in Scotland on account of uh, the ineptitude responsibility for which must stop at his desk. Uh, and then when he was promoted from uh, justice up to health minister, he oversaw waiting lists at record highs. But given that track record, the SNP made him first minister at that point. Scotland under the SNP was where they tried and failed in recent times to get a so-called named person into every child's life, that being a state-sponsored spy empowered to slip into every child's life, uh, to enter into and coax confidences from and with that child without the parents of the child even having to know. 
fortunately, the highest court in the land struck that proposed wickedness down in the end. And now we have Yusuf's hate crime laws, which are an overt push to silence free speech once and for all uh, by frightening and cowing the masses into keeping their mouths shut uh, rather than ever again risk saying what they think. Yusuf even made it the case that a person might be criminalised for things said in the privacy of the home. So it doesn't have to be something you put online for public consumption. It doesn't have to be something you say in the street or in the pub. It can be something you say in the, at the dinner table in your own home. And the, let's say your child repeats it the next day at school. You could get a knock at the door from the authorities. Laws affecting the online world, all around the world, seek always to hide their true intentions behind claims of protecting children, when in reality they're about silencing free speech, pure and simple. Hamza Yusuf's new legislation in Scotland is a threat in the real world, though. Ineptly and imprecisely policing words said out loud, as well as anything put on social media or whatever. In Scotland, the police can't get around to investigating burglaries and violent crime. You know, good luck getting any of that looked into if it happens to you, but they have nonetheless vowed that they will investigate every single complaint of hate crime. So we can see where the priorities lie. Even where investigation of a complaint finds that no crime was committed, Nonetheless, whatever was said or written will still be archived as a non-crime hate incident. How's that for a form of words? A non-crime hate incident that will be on an... It'll be against an innocent person's name on their permanent record forever, even though no crime was committed in the first place. I say Scotland is a failed state now. I say Scotland is an international laughing stock of a country presided over by a cacistocracy. And since April Fool's Day this week, for that was the day the new legislation went live, we've taken another step closer to it being illegal to disagree with the administration. And I say administration deliberately rather than government, because an administration is how that bunch in Holyrood in Edinburgh are most accurately described. This is where we are now, and what has been imposed on the people of Scotland today will surely find its way onto statute books around Britain and around the world sooner or later. The abomination in Scotland, though, described by the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, Roddy Dunlop, as a disaster waiting to happen, is best described, I say, as bad law. And bad law is what happens when politicians and their masters, the corporations and the banks and the non-governmental organisations and what have you, that set out to rule and not to serve. What we've got in Scotland now is the consequence of years. It's not just in Scotland, it's, it's throughout Britain. What we've got is the consequence of centuries, actually, of overmighty administrations seeking to hide from the people they should be serving the lawful truth of the relationship between office holders and the sovereign people of the country. Scheming power-hungry politicians and their collaborators would have the people believe that we are governed by them, that once elected by a majority, that they are in power. Among the many truths they seek to conceal is that they are only in office, no more than administrators, and that the only power in existence is the power of the sovereign people, that the people never surrender. Any politician who claims parliament is sovereign is either mistaken or lying. Either way, the claim is in breach of the Constitution, which was and remains out of reach of meddlesome here today gone tomorrow politicians. It stands to simple reason that any administration 
any government will, if it can, use legislation that it writes to write itself into a higher power. And it's that precise, inevitable temptation that our constitution was written eight centuries ago and counting to prohibit. Any legislation that an administration comes up with and writes and passes through Parliament is only that. It's legislation open at all times to being struck down, not just by succeeding administrations, but by the people of the land in real time, every minute of the day. The constitution by which we live is not statute. It's not mere legislation. And so it cannot be amended in any way by legislators, which is all that administrations actually are. That too few people understand the careful protections written into our constitution to keep us safe at all times from those in pursuit of power, kings, emperors, governments, that too many people have failed to grasp their own reality is one of the great tragedies of our present and our history. There is a profound difference between legislation and law. In the end, it's the common law, also called the law of the land, that is superior and, most important of all, always beyond the reach of administrations. If the day comes when people are at the mercy of an administration that has the power both to write legislation and impose the punishment for any breach of that legislation, then the people are no longer free in any way. On the contrary, they have submitted willingly or unwillingly, to lives lived under dictatorship. And the warning signs of this sly, perfidious sleight of hand by the latest crop of politicians are all around us. Consider, just for one, how much has appeared in our midst that we did not vote for, even. In Scotland, the people did not vote for Hamza Yusuf as First Minister. He was set there by others of his ilk. The people of the UK did not vote for a Tory party led by Rishi Sunak. Neither did they vote for Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor. They certainly didn't vote for David Cameron, installed as Foreign Secretary after first being made a member of the House of Lords so he could have the job. We didn't vote for online safety laws or hate crime laws. We have not been invited to vote for or against the new all-conquering powers that the World Health Organization is in the process of awarding unto itself. We've not been asked to vote on central bank digital currencies, 15 minute ghettos, digital IDs, or any of the rest of the techno infrastructure presently being erected around us like barbed wire. We didn't vote for the lockdowns that destroyed lives and our economy. We didn't vote for the near mandatory application of gene therapies under the guise of vaccines. We didn't vote for endless war in Ukraine or, or for the seemingly limitless funneling of our money, money we haven't even had the chance to earn yet, into the accounts of foreign administrations thousands of miles away. Ukraine, to name but one. And all of that happened, or is in the process of happening around us. And too many of us stand mutely by while politicians take our power from us and abuse it as though it were their own. The time has long since come when more people must accept that it's not just our right to shrug off and utterly disregard overmighty administrators with the temerity to seek to govern and not to serve. It's not just our right to do so. In the face of bad law, in the face of unlawful legislation, the onerous, often uncomfortable, even frightening work of throwing off would-be dictators is nothing less than our responsibility and our obligation. <laughs>